Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tullamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands. Worshaw.ie. Good evening and welcome to Country Life here on Midlands 103. MJ Cleary with you for the next hour up until 8pm. And delighted to be back with you this evening. This is my first full programme back in almost a month actually because we were clashing with hurling matches for a couple of weeks. I was also away for a week so we're back on track this evening. And speaking of hurling matches, a full house will descend on Nolan Park in Kilkenny this Saturday coming for the All-Ireland Under-20 Hurling Final where Offaly will take on Tipperary. Our first guest this evening on the programme is actually a Tipperary man so it might be a frosty affair between myself and Aidan Brennan in a moment. Uh, Aidan from the Irish Farmers Journal is going to chat to me about uh, grass growth, silage cutting, silage quality, um, milk yields, milk prices. We're going to go around the houses uh, for the dairy farmers in just a moment. So stay tuned for that. Also this evening, Bill O'Keefe from the IFA, he chats about a recent meeting which the IFA had with Revenue. You may remember a few weeks back we covered this on the programme. It was where Revenue had stopped refunding VAT on certain pieces of farm expenditure which had normally qualified some meal bins and dairy bulk tanks were to name just a couple. Um, There has been a lot of talk on this. The IFA have been lobbying on behalf of farmers and uh, the government. Uh, our meeting or revenue I should say our meeting with them it's not set in stone yet but there seems to be a little bit of comeback on it and we're going to have an update on that in just a moment also uh, the government yesterday they published their biomethane strategy and we're going to get an update on that from Bill as well and this is where they plan on having I have it in front of me here they plan on having uh, 200 anaerobic uh, digestion plants in Ireland by 2030 uh, so a little over five years and they have a budget of 40 million is what they're putting into it so I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to work out that that's not going anywhere or it's not going to work but we're going to talk about that in just uh, a few minutes with Bill also uh, this time of the year sees the annual Bloom Festival takes place in the Phoenix Park each June bank holiday weekend. Now I've attended this many years and I have to say it really is a great day out. So much to see and do. Uh, lots of Irish producers and a, just a, re- a really good day when the weather is nice. Kerry Gardner from Board B as Bloom will join me later to chat about this year's event as well as Patrick Weiser who is preparing a show garden. Patrick is living in Abbey Leaks and his garden is entitled Love Letter to Abbey Leaks. He's originally from the Czech Republic and uh, he's after putting together a show garden. He's going to talk all about that a little bit later on in the programme. Now, towards the end of the hour here on the show, we're featuring the National Famine Museum, Strokestown, County Longford. So last week was Famine Memorial Day and the museum is promoting a new exhibition which it's showing. And I think as food producers, the famine is something that resonates with us all. It's also such an important part of our heritage something we, we must never forget. So that's at the end of the programme. Text me in or WhatsApp me on 083 3010 103. Be happy to read out your comments or put any questions to our guests this evening. Now, as I said, the dairy to start off the hour and Aidan Brennan joins me. Aidan, many thanks for taking my call this evening. No worries, MJ. Uh, Aidan, look, uh, let's, let's start off. It's 29th of May. Normally, a silage cutting is in full flow, probably coming to the end on most high-level dairy farms if it was a normal year. Look, it's a long way off a, a normal year. It, it, it's happening, it's ebbing and flowing, um, but it's a challenge. Yeah, it's a real grab-and-go thing, really, MJ, this year. like Some farmers got the opportunity to cut uh, towards the end of last week, uh, but some of them got rained on as well because there was fierce thunder showers came over the country. Um, so look, it's, it's very much a grab-and-go. The only positive, you'd say, is that the forecast is looking better for this weekend, the coming weekend and nearly part of next week. So I would suggest a lot of farmers will, will get will take that opportunity to get silage cut uh, over the next couple of coming days. Uh, silage yields as well as everything else, Aidan, they, uh, they are back. They have to be back. Look, nitrogen was out later, but also just we, we just haven't had that burst of, of May growth and that for 10 or 12 or 14 days that we would normally have had at this day. Um, what are you hearing on the ground? Farmers obviously going to go going back for a second, probably a third cut uh, this year to try and make up the numbers. Yeah, I mean, yields are definitely back. I mean, grass growth was was back all year, really. Uh, it was back in February, March, April, and now again in May. And I suppose, look, the weather changed there middle of April and uh, the rain stopped, but it didn't. I was expecting grass growth to take off at that point. It didn't, you know. And I mean, here we are now, end of May, and, and we're still seeing farmers and hearing farmers complaining around poor grass growth rates. 
and it's reflecting the figures. And I mean, anyone that looks around the countryside, it, it does look washed out looking. Do you know, grass mm. is kind of yellowy. It's not the, the lush green that we'd expect. Um, and one of the comments back on the silage as well, I suppose, is that people that are measuring the nitrate levels in silage, which is obviously an important consideration for in siling. So your nitrates should be low. Um, but most of the results coming back very low for nitrate, mm. which kind of indicates to me that soil nitrate levels are very low. Um, whether they've been washed out or what, I don't know because of all the rain we've had. But there, you know, there, there's definitely a lack of soil reserve nitrogen, uh, nitrogen soil reserves in, in the ground. And uh, I think that's probably having an impact on grass growth. So, um, you know, if you're not keeping up to date in fertilizer, you'd know fairly quickly now this year because it's going to go yellow and, and stemmy and stressy uh, pretty quickly. And then, obviously, grass growth uh, has uh, not a knock-on effect. It is it is milk yield, essentially, at this time of the year. Uh, again, uh, what are farmers saying to you on how cows are milking and what's going into the tank? Oh, sure. I mean, it, it's quite obvious that they're well back, you know. And, I mean, again, fierce rain last week really put a, a, a dampener on things again in terms of in terms of milk yield. As all the farmers said, they saw, you know, the, the, the bulk tank collection is back a couple of hundred litres uh, on, a, on, a, on one collection to the next. Look, I mean, there's a couple of things at play here. We're going past peak milk production, so cows are going to reduce in milk, milk yield anyway. Um, but it's the rate of decline, I suppose, is what's concerning. Cows are also, you'd hope at this stage, in calf. And again, if once a cow goes in calf, she's going to milk less. Uh, but really, it's, it's down then to, to the weather and, 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 and the conditions uh, that they're grazing in. And if it's wet, and I mean, a lot of farmers had to house cows for periods last week uh, during those torrential um, uh, thunderstorms. Uh, because ground was just too wet. I mean, the, the met iron figure for soil moisture deficit is zero for most of the country. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you know, there's no deficit, there's no capacity in the ground to take more water. Um, so if you get 20, 30 mils in a, in a downpour, like it's it's just going to go to soup. But uh, back to milk yield, like, I mean, that's all having a knock-on effect. Um, uh, you know, most farmers will be peaking at 25, 26 litres, you know, the good operators. But like, they peak this year probably 22, 23, and now they're back to almost less than 20. So, you know, it does have a knock-on effect because there's extra costs gone in as well because farmers have been feeding more concentrate because of the weather, you know. So, look, I mean, it's a, it's, it's the, the, I'm, I'm not very positive tonight, like, because mm. I, I, that, that's what I'm hearing. Ah, sure, look, uh, in fairness to Aidan, you're just, you're being real, you know what I mean? It's, it's what you're hearing on the ground, so sometimes you just have to relay the honest message, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, but, I mean, look, everyone, I suppose the key position, or the key thing to remember, MJ, is that everyone's in the same place, you know. Everyone is finding it difficult. Um, there's no farmer I'm meeting who's, who's happy about the situation because grass is scarce in many farms as well. So they have to go in now with extra concentrate because, you know, because growth has been poor uh, and milk yield is bad and quality is bad. But I suppose looking, looking ahead, you'd have to say, you know, what steps are you going to put into place for the next couple of weeks uh, heading into June, which again is a key month for milk production. And, um, you know, if grass quality is poor, I'd be suggesting now and I get an opportunity over the next couple of days maybe to go topping after cows are, mm. are finished grazing and, that's not something I'd normally advise, but it, it's a kind of a year where it's so abnormal. Um, it might be the best thing to do because, you know, we've, we haven't had a good period for cows to clean out grass uh, fairly well in the paddock. It's been wet all spring. It's continuing to be wet. So residuals and clean outs are poor. That's going to have a knock-on effect for grass quality. And if grass quality is poor, you're going to, they're not going to milk as well in, in June and July. So maybe it's a year to go out topping um, this year, MJ, just, just as, a, as, as, a, as a kind of an option to try and uh, rectify or salvage as much as we can for the rest of the season. Yeah, I thought the exact uh, thing myself, uh, the moved cows, um, obviously I'm not dairy, but I moved uh, cattle out of a paddock the other day and I said to myself, it was like something you'd see middle of J- July. It was full of stem, mm. wasn't cleaned out at all. And uh, yeah, as you say, look, end of May, the topper could be uh, a tool uh, in your uh, repertoire uh, uh, this year. Just milk prices before I let you go, Aidan. Where, whereabouts are we at the moment, base prices? Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, I suppose when you include base price at this stage, MJ, it's, it's kind of irrelevant because most of the crops have, have these other support payments included and they're unconditional, so everyone gets them. But I mean, base price is in, is in around, you know, the 40 cent a litre. A lot of the crops then are still adding on one or two, one or two cent a litre on top of that. So, the, the, you know, including the VAT, the base is 42, for, or the, the total price is 42, 43. Um, that's back a little bit in many cases um, over since, since last month because some of the support payments have been reduced. So the likes of Tier Lawn reduced it by 1.5 cents a litre. Uh, in fairness to Lakeland, they held it the same, but they reduced the month prior. So that's kind of where they're at. There's no real change, but I suppose looking ahead to the international market, there was a big change there in the last 10 days, two weeks, a huge increase in demand for dairy and prices for butter, powders, cheese, 
everything you can think of is soaring at the moment. Now, look, it's too early to say if, if this is going to be a sustained price rise or not, but I mean, it's positive. Uh, and if it does continue, you'd have to say milk prices should be rising over the next couple of months. Yeah, I, I was keeping an eye on the, the global dairy trade actually. Butter, is, uh, especially, you just mentioned there, butter's gone through the roof altogether. Uh, there, there's some global going at the moment, whatever's happening. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I suppose production is back globally, um, MJ, so that's having an impact, you know. And it, it, I suppose it, the, the traders, the people who buy the products, they held out for a long time uh, in terms of, you know, uh, buying sharply. But I think their, their supplies are gone and buyers are active now in the market. Like, it took a long time for butter to reach the €6,000 a tonne mark. And then, you know, it, it, it reached that last week, and now it's almost at €6,600. You know, so it's, a, it's had a mm. huge increase, increase by over €400 this week on the spot market. Um, so there's a big demand there, and cream is the same, you know, so there's a huge demand for, for products at the minute. Uh, and it's, 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 it's all over the place, really. It's not just China. You know, China still aren't an active buyer. Um, the economy there is still going poorly. Their own internal production has increased. But, I mean, you're seeing uh, reductions in supply in Ireland, back 7-8%, uh, and the same across Northern Europe. So, you know, while it's bad for farmers uh, that are making milk because they're not, they're not selling as much of it, you know, it, it is going to have a positive impact on milk price. So yeah. hopefully it's pointing towards, if it got good weather and good prices towards the back end of the year, I think everyone would, would be happier. Yeah, absolutely. Ed, and we'll say many thanks for joining me here on the programme, giving us a rundown, and we will speak to you in the not-too-distant future. Many thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Ed Brennan there from the Farmer's Journal. Look, rundown across the board there. Uh, hard to be overly positive, really, in any aspect of agriculture at the moment. A grass growth this time of the year, we're expecting it to be uh, as good as it gets, and it is far, far, far from it. And I'm just noticing uh, silage cutting uh, around my neck of the woods. Very minimal uh, going on at the moment, to be honest. Normally, this time of the year, you'd be coming down uh, last Wednesday in May, and you would see tractors, trailers, harvesters in the roads, uh, main roads, side roads, everywhere. Uh, absolutely nothing going on uh, these last few days. And obviously, look, the weather having that massive effect. I, no- I noticed myself a little laneway up at the back of the house up to a field, and there is a puddle of water lying in it for the last few days, and you'd have to wear your Wellingtons walking through it. So... Not a good sign for the last few days of May. I agree with Aidan as well on the topping. I think this is the year where uh, the topper will have to be pulled out maybe a month or six weeks earlier than normal to try and salvage a bit of quality going into June. And look, it is obviously still very, very, very early in the year and uh, we get a little blast of good weather now. We've lots of moisture in the ground. Hopefully things will kick off. Look, You don't like saying that on nearly the 1st of June. Hopefully things will kick off. We should be right in the midst of it now. But look, it, it, it is what it is and we have to work with the weather we have. So fingers crossed uh, this dry spell coming up uh, gets it moving for us all. Now coming up after the break, Bill O'Keefe from the IFA is going to speak to us about the changes in VAT and also the government's biomethane strategy. So will you be a farmer who is producing top quality silage in a few years instead of feeding it to your cattle? Are you going to be feeding it into an anaerobic digester? Uh, that's what the government wants you to do or wants some of you to do anyway. So let's hear about that in just a moment. Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tillamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands. Worshaw.ie you're very welcome back to Country Life here on Midlands 103. Now, we're moving on to uh, Business Matters. IFA Business Chair Bill O'Keefe joins me on the line. Bill, many thanks for taking my call this evening. Thanks very much, MJ. No problem at all coming on. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill. Two issues we want to chat through this evening. One of those is something which uh, farmers are very interested in, and that's uh, VAT reclamation on certain items on the farm. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But in advance of that, yesterday, the government came out with their biomethane strategy uh, for, I suppose, up until 2030, really. Um, biomethane, let's just start at the, at the beginning. Where's better to start, says you? Uh, what is is this about, uh, Bill, biomethane for the average farmer? How is it going to affect them or, or what exactly is it? Yeah, biomethane is used in an anaerobic digestion plants to produce gas from feedstocks, a small amount of slurry, small amount of dung maybe, mostly high quality forages, feedstocks such as silage, whole crop, um, maize silage and, and fodder beet or beet in general, sugar beet or fodder beet, they'd be the main stock fed in and gas comes out and digestate comes out the far end. The digestate can go back out to farms to be used as fertiliser and obviously the gas then goes into the grid or into a business locally to, to be used. 
Yeah, so it's, look, it's, it sounds straightforward. Well, I wouldn't say straightforward, but look, it sounds reasonable and uh, it's understandable. The issue, I suppose, is, well, firstly, we're already talking to Aidan Brennan there just before the break and we're talking about silage and uh, the bulk at the moment is down. Uh, so we're, we're doing well, kind of feed the amount of cattle we have in the country uh, as is. So if we bring in these AD plants and then silage and beet and, and, and maize and whatnot are going to be fed into these, Obviously, the government plan is a lessening in the amount of livestock in the country then if there's going to be a shortfall of feed. Yeah, I suppose well, this, it'll substitute out livestock feed for, for biomethane production. So yeah, the, in some areas you'll see livestock numbers reducing and it will, it will take up that feed. Um, very difficult to see which way to go. Like Farmers will have to see profit in this for it to work, MJ, and to back it. It's not just... We'll, we'll provide silage and, and give us a little bit over the cost for silage. There needs to be real profit in for farmers mm. to change their system. And in certain parts of the country, it's going to be very difficult. You're talking about high quality forages. Like to be a history down, I'm in, I'm in Kilkenny in the southeast, the history of growing beet around here. There, there was a factory in Carlo and in Mallow and Cork. That part of the country, you're, you're growing better quality forages than you are over the west and the mm-hmm. north of the country, and it's more difficult to grow those crops. So there may not be as much substitution in some areas. And then in other areas, yeah, the IFA isn't too comfortable about seeing food production moving over to energy. And I suppose there's another part to that then. What, is the, what way are the emissions going to be calculated? So is the, the emissions from growing those crops, are they going to be attributed to the agriculture sector or the energy sector? Because we know already that when we produce energy from renewables on farm, the credits go to the energy sector and the carbon reductions go to the energy sector rather than the agriculture sector. So is this going to be more of the same? Mm, that's and big... farmers won't stand for that and they won't, they won't support it unless there's, I suppose, profit in it or, or some logic in it from that point of view. And just looking at the figures here that the government... Uh, now, look, the government are well used to putting out things that uh, are pie in the sky, but this, is a, this, is, this one is, you know, it's, it's, it's really, like, it's ridiculous in a way. 200 anaerobic digestion plants by 2030 uh, and a budget or funding. Now, obviously, there's going to be an increase of 40 million. Like, to, the 200 plants alone, let alone the 40 million, we're now uh, May 2024. Uh, you know, if you're going to build a small shed on the farm, it could take a year, year and a half of planning, let alone an anaerobic digestion plant. And, uh, like, sure, there's not going to be the colour of these built by 2030. You know, oh, if there's going to be, if, there, we, if there's going to be a few we, at all. Yeah, well, we could call the targets aspirational at best. You know, to be generous to them, but no, very unachievable. I'd say, yeah, there isn't going to be that number of plants built by uh, 2030. The funding for this is 40 million. Uh, the IFA director of policy, uh, Ty Buckley, was over in Denmark, where they would have a very um, well-established anaerobic system out there and biomethane production out there and we'd be estimating that four to five hundred million would be needed <laughs> to build that number of plants and I mean the expertise isn't there the capacity isn't there in the system to build these plants at the moment so it, it isn't going to happen by 2030 but there's no harm having these kind of goals that are very high and maybe we'd get a certain number built I, and, and I have no idea how many yeah, no, but you're did. looking at multiples of 40 million that the government have uh, earmarked for this project to make it happen and who puts in that money do farmers put it in is it going to be like the solar or wind sectors where outside investors come in and they do the heavy lifting on the spending side but they also do the heavy lifting on the profit side on the way out and farmers once again get excluded out of the real profits in these things so that's where we'd be worried you know uh, could this be something, uh, Bill, if we went back many moons ago and we had the great Horace Plunkett set up the cooperative movement in Ireland and we saw how, we see how well it's done with, uh, with all the, the co-ops in, in the country, all the milk co-ops. If farmers were to get together now, a number of farmers, and uh, go down, look, you, you'd need some, a lot of expertise. I'm not saying this would be any way easy. Uh, you might go into partnership maybe with a, with a company on it, but uh, a kind of a cooperative thing where the farmers would part on one of these AD plants and then they, they might actually be able to generate some, some real money from them. Yeah, we'd like to see that. Look at if they were well supported by government funding and grants and maybe well supported with SBCI loans at low interest rates. Maybe there's a structure there that could be pulled together for farmers to get involved at ownership level and maybe take some more of the profits at a higher level out of the thing. But look, to be honest, the expertise, as you say, you highlighted yourself. We're very short on that. And you're talking about real money here. You're not talking about hundreds of thousands. You're talking about hundreds of millions. And it's not going to be simple to put it together. Look, it, it won't happen in won't happen in five or six years, that's for sure. But it would, it would be, I suppose, achievable to get a certain number of these plants built 
by 2030 and maybe more built by 2040 and get this sort of a sector established. But again, are the emissions from the production of feedstocks for this going to be attributed to agriculture or energy? And does it reduce agricultural emissions by producing feedstocks for these plants? Or does it just keep agricultural emissions at the same and reduce the energy sector's um, footprint? Mm. They're the questions that we need answered. But ultimately, it needs more funding, needs more expertise. And farmers would want to see profit in it for them, as I said, to change system, to move away from livestock. And look, it'd be nice to be able to maybe destock some farms if people get to an age where they're willing to do that or stage of life or whatever and put together maybe a nest egg from selling stock and then move over to producing um, crops for the likes of these plants. In theory, it could work for, for some farmers, but again, is there money in it for those farmers? Is there profit in it for those farmers? Or what are the real figures that we're looking at down the road? Yeah, they are the questions. Bill, before I let you go, just a minute, uh, at about a minute and a half left. Uh, you've been doing some great work uh, lobbying the government the revenue in relation to VAT reclamation for farmers. Oh, there was meal bins and there was uh, dairy bulk tanks, automatic scrapers. Suddenly we couldn't reclaim the VAT on those a few months ago. Where are we at at the moment on that, Bill? Okay, so I'm sorry, there's a bit of noise in the background. No, you're okay, we you um, Yeah, so the the bulk milk tanks, new bulk milk tanks going into a greenfield site are fine. Replacement bulk tanks, uh, we're working on getting those over the line as well. Uh, milk silos, if somebody's considering which to put in, milk silos would look at, look to be more favourable. They're looking, our revenue are looking at those as more infrastructure than a milk tank that sits on the ground. They're bolted to concrete under a bigger structure. So if anybody is considering to just price up a milk silo as well, there might be a better opportunity to get that back and that. Look, there was a lot of items that were reclaimed over the last 30, 40 years. Some of those are still fine, and we need a guidance note just to say what is fine. We're hoping to get um, cubicle mats, slat mats back in. Water systems are fine. Again, we were getting a few refusals on them, but they're, they're cleared. Um, fencing is fine. Gates are fine. Mobile sheep handling units wouldn't be fine, but a lot of um, a lot of gates would be fine, or a series of gates, or anything like mm-hmm. that. Anything that's called gates or fencing is fine. Um, so we're working on the likes of milking machines and calf feeders, and where farmers add a number of units to a milking machine in an existing building, and where a farmer maybe does a bit of building work in a calf shed and adds a calf feeder, or builds a new calf shed and puts in a calf feeder, getting the vat back in the calf feeder. It's uh, something we've pushed very hard on and worked very hard to try and get over the line and we'll see how we go. We've, we've looked at robotic scrapers. Some people would have got fat back in those. Technically, reading the legislation, they shouldn't have and they are not eligible for a fat reclaim on the VAT 58 form anymore. And some items like the large slurry bags that might be used to store slurry on an out farm or something like that, they're, they're also ineligible. But... Look, we're hopeful. The feed bins, revenue, we're looking at feed bins from 10 tonnes upwards. Look, we pushed hard for the, the dry stock sector to get that down to 5 tonnes and upwards. That's probably the smallest bin that you're going to put on farm for bulk delivery and bolt to the ground on farm. So that's what we're working on. Milking machines proven troublesome, but we are working hard on it. And the calf feeders, look, it's the big one that we see a lot of dairy farmers and beef farmers that are doing calf to beef looking at investing in over the next 10 years. And uh, look, we're hopeful on that and working hard on that to try and get over the line. Very good, Bill. And uh, as, you, the, as you say, when guidance you have a... note, yes. there will be a, yeah, there'll be a guidance note out from revenue in the coming weeks as to what is definitely in and what is definitely out. And uh, that's just give everybody a bit of clarity and then people can plan financially for their investments. And same as buying a tractor, you don't get the VAT back in the tractor, but you look at the price of it and you know what it's going to cost and you can make your plan from there. Yeah, and when we get that guidance note, we might have a, a, a quick word with you again. And we're going to say many thanks. Let's you back to the Camogie match, Bill, and thanks for joining us here on the programme. Thanks, MJ. Good night. Uh, Bill O'Keefe there, IFA Farm Business Chair and the... Uh, the, the anaerobic digestion, look, you don't really need to speak much about that. It's, it's miles off happening, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been put out there as one of the things that's going to bring our carbon emissions down going forward. Uh, the VAT reclamation on those different areas, I'll run through that when we get the guidance note. Uh, the calf feeders is the big one. Can't get VAT back on those at the moment, but IFA are lobbying on that. Slurry bags is a real unfortunate one. I had Willie Dunn here from slurrybags.ie, County Offaly based uh, company back a number of months ago. And as Willie said, if you go out and you try and move one of those 
lorry bags he would like to see it happening they're, they're literally immovable once they go to a farm but because technically they can be moved from one farm to another then VAT cannot be reclaimed on them but there just needs to be a more solid thinking on this uh, because it's nonsense really like a lot of the uh, policy decisions that are made but this is a, a, an exceptional one just on, on some of those areas with VAT reclamation um, the slurry bags are immovable once they go in especially once slurry goes into them VAT should be able to be reclaimed on them Just there should be no question or, or doubt about that Coming up after the break, we're going to move over to Bloom. It's taking place this weekend, the June Bank Holiday weekend in the Phoenix Park. And we have Kerry Gardner from Bloom and also Patrick Weiser, uh, who has designed a garden entitled Love Letter to Abbey Leaks. We're going to hear about that in just a moment. Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tillamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands. Worshaw.ie. Uh, Bloom, which is taking place this weekend in the Phoenix Park. It is the annual event, which has been going from strength to strength over the past number of years. And we have Kerry Gardner. She's from Boards B is Bloom. We hope to have uh, Patrick Weiser as well. He is uh, designing a garden entitled Love Letter to Abbey Leaks. Uh, just a bit of an issue getting Patrick on the line. So I'm going to start with Kerry. Hopefully we can get Patrick towards the end of the interview. Kerry, many thanks for taking my call this evening. You're the busiest woman in Ireland this week, I would say. <laughs> oh, one of a few, yeah, quite busy now as we ramp up and prepare to open the gates tomorrow morning to welcome visitors to site in the Phoenix Park. And uh, the Bloom Festival, uh, Kerry, is something that has gone from strength to strength. Can you give us a little bit of a background on it? How long has it been on the go? The brainchild behind it, I suppose. How long it's been on the go and true to today? Yeah, I guess um, Bloom, this is 18th Bloom. It uh, started in 2008. And I guess it's an event to, in the first case, highlight Irish kind of horticulture and Irish grown plants. And then obviously as it's grown on in the years, it's now celebrating gardening, but it's moved into kind of food as well. So it's kind of food, drink uh, and obviously horticulture. Um, So it's a showcase of all those wonderful things in Ireland that we grow, produce uh, here. Yeah, it's a real testament to uh, Ireland and to Irish produce and to Irish small producers, big producers. The one thing I like about it, I've gone many a time, is when you go into the, uh, the, the different food stalls and the different food tents and you see the, uh, the small to medium-sized businesses selling their wares, it's a real testament to what we can produce in Ireland on both a small and a large scale. Indeed it is, yeah, and it's, it, it's a joy to be in there and, and to meet the makers and creators uh, of the food and to hear firsthand and their passion uh, if it is what they're or making or growing as you say. Uh, Kerry as well it must be uh, a really nice thing to be involved in not only you have the food producers but then you also have and we're going to be talking to Patrick in just a moment but you also have the garden designers so you have uh, the, the the Chelsea garden side of it if you will where you have these uh, show gardens that are just these fantastic lovely tranquil beautiful spaces that people have put their heart and soul into that are telling a story so there's that aspect to it as well so it must be a, a real um, enjoyable experience when you're setting this up uh, dealing with these creative people and then seeing what they actually bring to fruition yeah you're right and it, it starts like our planning starts uh, like last from last autumn and we're working for many many months with, with all the designers and the contractors and the growers and as you said patrick uh, has brought his garden and his ideas to life in the park which is always wonderful to see and this is now enjoying the fruit of the labor it's been you know a tough three weeks uh, for the designers and we've had a cooler spring than normal so maybe a lot of plants uh, aren't where people might have wanted them to be and there's been a few substitutes and a few worries uh, but we're here and um, any swapping around has been done uh, the gardens are now judged and we're ready tomorrow morning to open the gates and let the public come in to see the wonderful work as you said and no more than Patrick's garden among them Yeah and that's my next question Kerry so gates are open tomorrow you're running from Thursday through to uh, Monday I presume you're looking at Met Aaron the same as every farmer in the country who's trying to cut silage you're looking at it to make sure it doesn't rain what are you thinking in the Phoenix Park over the next four days are you going to get dry weather? Yeah we are the forecasts are good you know and sometimes maybe during the build you're looking at different apps to get the right outcome but it's been fairly more or less fairly accurate in terms of what we've been forecasting what we've had on the ground uh, a few light, light showers uh, today, but nothing too bad. 
mean, I'm from Galway, so <laughs> I'm pretty used to the rain. <laughs> um, but no, it's been okay, and I think that the forecast is dry for the weekend. And I think, you know, p- p- look at the forecast, and maybe if you're coming up, prepare, bring a light jacket if it's needed, um, and then you'll, you'll be pretty set, you know. Uh, do you need to book tickets in advance, Kerry, or can you just buy them on the gate on the way in? You can buy them on the gate on the way in, but, you know, if you do want to book them in advance, there's no harm in doing that. And they're, if you go to borbiabloom.com, and click on the tickets, which will take you to the Ticketmaster site, and you'll be able to get your tickets there. And also, obviously, we've got great links with public transport, uh, whether you're coming into Euston or Conley and getting the Lewis across. We offer a free shuttle bus service from Park Gate Street, and there's constant buses on loops, bringing people up from the park and back down again to get their bus, bus train connections uh, to homeward bound. And again, we have uh, ample parking on site for those who are maybe not able to avail easily of public transport. So again, if you're booking tickets online, you can also book your parking online so you kind of can get all that sorted before you leave home. Yeah, excellent. So for, for people travelling up from the Midlands, very straightforward, even if you're getting the train up or you're into Houston Station or indeed drive and park in Houston Station, pop up, get a bus across the road and you're up in a few minutes. Uh, I've done it myself a number of times and I have to say it's always very well laid on. Kerry, I'm going to let you back to the work. I'm going to say many thanks for joining me. You're going to have a really busy weekend. Hopefully the weather's on your side and I'm going to say thanks for joining me here on the programme. Now, I'm moving across to Patrick Weiser. Patrick is uh, working, well, has the work done on his uh, garden called Love Letter to Abbey Leak. So a great local theme here. Patrick, many thanks for taking my call this evening. Well, how are you? Uh, Very good, Patrick. So tell us the background to this, please, Patrick. Love Letter to Abbey Leaks. What's it about? Well, the garden is a concept garden about representing Abbey Leaks House and Farm and Abbey Leaks Town and basically mixing it together to create unity and represent the community of that area. Uh, Very good. And what was the inspiration behind it, uh, Patrick? You're obviously a a native of that neck of the woods. I live in Abelix. I work at Abelix House and Farm, so the inspiration was all around me. Yeah, very good. Now, Abbey Leaks House and Farm is a big, big place. Uh, the show gardens in Bloom are quite small. So how did you manage to translate such a vast expanse into such a small area? It was definitely a challenge to bring 1,200 acres into 35 metres square. Uh, I hope I managed well. I'll find out tomorrow. And um, yeah, it was, it was challenging, but I was inspired by all the planting. So then it was just about figuring out how am I going to mix it together so it makes sense and it flows very well. Uh, what style did you go for in the garden, Patrick? Ex- explain it to us, if you can, over the airwaves so people can't see it. So uh, give us a visual picture of it. So I went for a lot of purples, a lot of blue colours, a uh, lot of green as well, trying to make it lovely and lush and full so that audience can, that the people can see, you know, the, the richness of such an area that I'm trying to represent, that it's, you know, it's very eccentric planting, so it's it's hopefully hopefully representing very well the area I'm trying to represent. Yeah, very good. And how did you get into garden design, uh, Patrick? What was your background? Well, I got into horticulture basically a little bit by accident, and I uh, absolutely fell in love with it. And since then, started playing with design aspect of horticulture and gardening. Uh, and that from then, I spiraled. I went into, I applied to Super Guardian back in 2019. I went through that process. Uh, at the time, I was in second year of college studying horticulture and was just slowly working towards, you know, playing, playing bigger parts in designing. Yeah, very good, uh, Patrick. Well, we're going to wish you all the best uh, tomorrow. Is it the judges, uh, the judging, I should say, happens tomorrow for the gardens, is it? Uh, will you find out tomorrow whether you get a, a, a prize or, or what type of medal you get? Yes, so the judging was happening for the last two days and uh, tomorrow, tomorrow I'll find out how I go on. So well, not nervous at all. <laughs> well, all the hard work has been done. So I suppose at this stage, it's a matter of just sitting back and enjoying then the public coming in and chatting to you over the course of the next few days. So we wish you all the best here uh, from uh, Country Life on Midlands 103. It's a local garden with a local feel to it. Hopefully you do well. And many thanks for joining us here on the programme. Well, thank you very much for having me.
More than welcome, Patrick. Patrick Weiser there and Kerry Gardner uh, speaking about Board B as Bloom, which takes place this weekend in the Phoenix Park from tomorrow through till Monday. Now, I am going to leave that there. I'm going to go to an ad break. And after the break, we're going to be talking about the National Famine Museum uh, as a result of it being National Famine Commemoration Day last week. And they have a new exhibition that John O'Driscoll, their general manager, is going to speak to us about. So stay tuned. Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tillamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands. Worshaw.ie. And you're very welcome back to Country Life here on Midlands 103. Just before I move on to the next uh, segment, I was talking about Bloom just before the break and we had Patrick Weiser. He has a garden entitled Love Letter to Abbey Leaks. Uh, there is also a girl from Offaly. Now, I could have the second name incorrect. It's Louise C-H-E-C-A Cheka. Uh, and uh, the design is a Space for Possibilities, the modular garden. And uh, that is also going to be on offer over the next few days in Bloom. So Leash and Offaly both represented in Bloom this coming weekend. Now, as I said, moving on to famine related theme. And I have John O'Driscoll. He is general manager at Strokestown Park and the National Famine Museum. John, many thanks for taking my call this evening. Hi, MJ. Thank you very much for having me on the show this evening. Uh, You're more than welcome, John. It's a a tip of the cap to a couple of different things. So firstly, you have a new permanent exhibition open in uh, Strokestown Park House. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But uh, before that, it it was famine, National Famine uh, Commemoration Day last week. And any time I see a a famine-related topic here on the programme, usually about once a year, something to do with yourselves or whatnot, I'll always pick it up because we are a farming-related programme, food producers uh, from around the Midlands and further afield listen to us. And the famine was one of those times where, as we know, uh, if you were growing your own food, unfortunately it stopped and uh, and there was a a significant price to pay. I think it's always important for country dwellers and farmers to uh, remember the famine and to remember the time that it was. And I'm sure you're so used to talking about it, John, uh, up in the museum there. We sure are, and you're so right, MJ. It is is such um, an important part of our history, a tragic part of our history, and something that should really, we really have to remember, um, because we lost so many of our people through starvation or through emigration. It's it's very important, and the National Famine Commemoration Day there last week, it's so wonderful to see that, that happening every year now. Yeah, absolutely, John. And uh, your own uh, premises up there, so it's Strokestown Park House in the National Farming Museum. Just talk to us a little bit about the the Farming Museum itself. It's on the go a while, but uh, it got a bit of a refurb uh, a few years ago. Can you explain that to us? Uh, yes, MJ, the Strokestown Park and the National Famine Museum, we're an Irish Heritage Trust property here in County Roscommon in Ireland's Hidden Heartlands. The museum opened in 1994, but just recently there's been a whole new museum put in, a reinterpretation of the museum, telling the story of the famine. It reopened there with Falls Ireland support in 2022. Um, it's a very immersive experience. It's using the Strokestown Park archive, the papers that were found in Strokestown house here to tell the story of the famine. Everything from eviction notices to immigration lists to pleas from tenants, they're all there just telling that story. And for um, people who attend then, so the, uh, the Strokestown Park, if you're not familiar with Strokestown Park House then, is the, uh, the manor house, if you will, uh, where the, uh, the higher class, the gentry lived at, at the time. And then the Fan Museum shows how the other half lived or the complete opposite, if you will. Absolutely, yeah. Strokestown House, we, the, the, there's many elements to it, but we, the, you just said it exactly there. There's Strokestown House, which was the landlord's house. There were the Pack and Mahan families that lived there. And during the Great Irish Famine, the landlord there, due to his immigration, eviction uh, policies, he ended up being assassinated. He was the first landlord assassinated during the Great Irish Famine. And it's his archive that's telling the story of the museum now. The, the Famine Museum is there. It's in what were the old farmyards, stable yards of the house, sitting in the shadow of the house. And that's the, one of the unique things about Strokestown Park. You come, you see the house, you see how the landed gentry lived, the grandeur, the luxury. 
And then you walk across the yard and you see another side of the story when you go into the National Famine Museum, the story of the tenants, those people living outside the estate walls and how different it was for them. We often, the Irish Heritage Trust, we often talk about it as parallel lives, just going side by side, so different but so connected. Yeah, parallel lives is a great uh, way to describe it, uh, John. The recent permanent exhibition that you have, again, shows that parallel uh, life that uh, these two peoples lived. Can you explain to us what you have on offer now in the museum, please? Absolutely. This is this is in the house and they were in, on the guided tour of the house. In Strokestown House, we have the, it's a galleried kitchen. It's the last remaining kitchen intact of its type in, in Ireland. The lady of the house never, ever came into the kitchen. She went, went, followed, went up the stairs onto a gallery above the kitchen where she could supervise her staff from a nice safe distance from above the staff. Um, it's it's really unique that it's still there. So just recently, with support from the regional exhibition scheme, uh, with funding from the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaelic, Sport and Media, and Westward Holdings, the owners of Stroke Sound Park, we did an exhibition interpreting the kitchen, telling the story of the servants, telling the story of the food. We're calling it food, feasts, and footmen because. It shows the elaborate foods, everything they grew in the walled gardens. In Strokestown, in our walled gardens, they were growing pineapples, peaches, melons, figs, grapes to, to supply the house, to supply the dining room. And we've, we've interpreted that story, just showing exactly what it was like in the kitchen. Um, the wonderful food historian Regina Sexton from Cork and the Irish Heritage Trust team did some amazing research in the National Library, digging out menus and in the Strokes and Archive um, receipts and from, from garden centres where they were buying seed for the walled gardens. So we're telling that whole story, connecting the gardens, connecting the kitchen, connecting the dining room and the story of the servants. And that's on permanent display as part of the tour of the house now. Um, what was on the menu back then, John? Can you, can you think when you were looking back through it? Was there any dishes that uh, stru- struck your mind? Yeah, there, well, I'll just talk about it. There, there were two two menus, I, I know, two, not menus, sorry, two um, recipes that came from the National Library from the Strokestone Park papers that were up there. And it was a, a potato pudding, which I think is great that there, there's a potato pudding and then ju- just across the yard we've got the famine museum telling the story of the Great Irish Famine. But this potato, it's, it's like, it's, um, it's, a, it's not a savoury, it's a dessert made out of potatoes and sugar and all that sort of thing. It doesn't sound very nice. And there's also an orange pudding, which sounds a little bit better because they're putting some sort of brandy into it. But um, So they're just two. But then we're looking in the dining room. It's set, the dining room is set for, um, for a dinner party. And like the first course has about eight or nine, maybe ten dishes. And then the second course could have up to 12 dishes. Mm, yeah. So it, it's kind of shocking. We in this exhibition too, part of it, we compare the menu, the, the food that was eaten by the people in the big house, by the servants, by the strong farmer, and right down into the more cottier tenant. And as you look at the list, it gets quite small and small as you go down to the end of that list, going down to the cottier tenant, what they had on their menu every day coming up to the Great Irish Famine. In most cases, yeah, coming to the end, it was about £14 pounds of potatoes a day. Yeah. It's um, when you see it and when you hear it, uh, as you say, John, when you see it every day and you see it written down, it must only uh, add to its uh, significance. Uh, John, I'm just uh, running out of time. We're still talking to you all evening now, I have to say, but unfortunately, we're down to the last 40 seconds. For people who wish to visit your premises up there, John, tell us over the course of the summer uh, how how you go about it, uh, booking uh, when you're open, opening hours, etc. Absolutely. We're open seven days a week, right through now, all year round, um, from 10 o'clock to 6 o'clock now during the summer season. You can visit strokestonepark.ie if you want some more information or look out, look for a Strokestone Park on Facebook or Instagram. We have many events running through the summer. And do you know what? We were talking earlier, MJ, we were just praying for a bit of sunshine. Mm. Same, same, as, same as everyone involved in agriculture in, in the country. Uh, John, we're just out of time and I'm going to say many thanks uh, for speaking to me this evening. Really enjoyed the chat there over the last few minutes and no doubt, look, we'll all get sunshine and you'll have a very busy summer up in Strokestown. Many thanks, John. Thank you very much, MJ. Thanks a million. You too. Thanks.
uh, John O'Driscoll there, General Manager of Stroke Sound Park and the National Famine Museum. And uh, as John said, open seven days a week, all year round. Somewhere I keep meaning to visit because I'll be driving up that neck of the woods when I'm going up to um, Ashling, my wife's uh, part of the world. Go up, actually just past it pretty much. There's a signpost down. We go from Burr up to Athlone and on through Tulsk and French Park up to that part of the world. And I uh, often mean to visit it and I will do at some stage that is it for this evening's programme thanks to John for joining us there thanks to Patrick Weiser and best of luck to him in Bloom this weekend and also Kerry Gardner for speaking to us about the event Bill O'Keefe from the IFA and also uh, Aidan Brennan from the Farmers Journal the show is repeated on Sunday morning at 7am true to 8am I will be back with you uh, this time next week as always uh, 7pm uh, wherever you get your podcast, you can type in MJ Space Cleary C-L-E-R-Y and we will pop up uh, and you can listen at your leisure so we'll talk to you next week good night and God bless